You're two hours on a plane, but you're traveling back 400 years in history. Each of us had to write down three questions that we gave the answers to in case we were kidnapped and the uh, organization for which we worked had to call the kidnappers and, and demand proof that we were still alive. Our security guy had a beeper in his front right pocket, so if he was killed, we knew to reach into his front right pocket and to set off an emergency alert that would bring in a medevac. Getting on the plane for my second trip to Afghanistan was a little bit easier than the first time I got on the plane. Um, since I've been there once before, it uh, was easier because I had a better idea of what to expect once we got there. I knew that uh, it was going to be warm and that I was going to be all covered up and I knew what to pack. So the, train, the trip on the plane itself was actually pretty nice, um, but it is 12, 13, 14 hours on an overseas flight and actually we were flying from Washington DC into Dubai. Spent a few hours there kind of acclimating ourselves to that type of climate and then had to take a short trip back over to the airport there uh, for a short two hour flight into Kabul, Afghanistan. I have a friend who's taken this flight a couple of times and the way he describes it is that you're two hours on a plane but you're traveling back 400 years in history and the distinction between Dubai and Kabul. You know, the difference is so extraordinary. You're leaving a gleaming city that's uh, very artificial, um, built up uh, a lot of man-made structures, islands that have been built out into the ocean, um, and you're flying into a land that's uh, something that you're not used to. Kabul, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's a teeming city of over four million people by latest estimates. There are shops and there are uh, taxis and a lot of traffic, you know, I've taken pictures of the traffic there. Thousands of people, you know, out on their bicycles. There are clearly no rules of the road. So when you come in and drive from the airport to the hotel, uh, you're kind of taking your life into your own hands. In fact, uh, as we were driving along, I was keeping my eyes peeled for a local restaurant, um, Afghan fried chicken, which is a, always an interesting landmark when you're passing by that. It looks a lot like a Kentucky fried chicken, but um, indeed it is Afghan fried chicken and one of the local eateries. Uh, a lot of people don't think about things like that. It, it is a, a normal city. You can get Chinese food, you can get Mexican food, you can get fried chicken, um, but we didn't have many opportunities to venture out of the hotel. We were in a high security situation. Um, as Westerners visiting the country, obviously we were being kept uh, pretty closely guarded and um, so not much opportunity to drive about the streets of Kabul and see the people and visit the local points of interest. We spent our days from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock every night in briefings and the briefings covered all of the different aspects of an observation mission. So we went over the basics of election law in Afghanistan, which doesn't differ very much from basic U.S. election law. Uh, the one man, one vote principle stands. There's voter cards, there's voting booths, and um, you know many of the same things that we're used to here uh, against a very different backdrop. But we went into training about what to do if you're kidnapped. Uh, we had about half a day training on kidnapping training, how to survive that. Um, each of us had to write down three questions that we gave the answers to in case we were kidnapped and the uh, organization for which we worked had to call the kidnappers and, and demand proof that we were still alive. Um, these would be the questions we'd be asked to answer to give the answers to prove that we were still living. Those are our proof of life questions. We also had a dynamic rescue, rescue question and dynamic rescue they've described to us basically is that you know you're on the verge of being killed and if indeed uh, you're at that edge oftentimes you'll be videotaped like I'm doing right now um, but you'll be giving a speech to your captors essentially saying yes I'm here um, to attack the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan or I am an infidel or whatever speech they may have you say but you would have an opportunity perhaps to slip in a few words. So they asked each of us to write down a short phrase that we would attempt to slip into that speech. And upon reviewing those tapes, if they heard that catchphrase, they would know that in our opinion, 
we were um, about to be executed and they would attempt a dynamic rescue. Basically that means we're giving them opportunity to come in and say, guns blazing, you may get killed during this rescue attempt, but you've given us the signal that you believe you're about to die anyway. So um, this is our kind of last ditch attempt to rescue you. We got onto a small propeller plane, um, one, that, one row of seats down each side of the plane, and you could talk to the pilot. He was right there in front of you. He couldn't stand up in this plane, one of those little tiny ones, and started our flight to Bamiyan, which is in a province in central Afghanistan. An absolutely beautiful place. Uh, Bamiyan province is also one of the most peaceful areas of Afghanistan, so I was pleased to have a deployment to such a lovely area. And we traveled from the airport in our secure vehicles. We'd have two vehicles wherever we went. In the front seat, we'd have an Afghani driver, and then we'd have a member of our security team. And then the two of us would be in the middle seat, um, and in the back would be a fair amount of weaponry that we kept on us wherever we went. Then there'd be another car that followed us with two shooters, as we called them. Our shooters were in the back car, and they knew that if our car was hit by a roadside bomb or some sort of insurgent attack, that they would swoop in. So every time we got in the car, we went through the drill. What do we do if we have a flat? What do we do if we're attacked? What do we do if we blow up? Um, our security guy had a beeper in his front right pocket. So if he was killed, we knew to reach into his front right pocket and to set off an emergency alert that would bring in a medevac. We were able to visit with um, a candidate for office, a female candidate for office. Again, as I said, Bamiyan province is one of the more peaceful. It's also one of the more progressive areas of the country. They have a female governor, the only female governor in Afghanistan out of the 34 provinces. And they also had numerous female candidates for office. And we were able to actually go to the home of a candidate who uh, welcomed us into her home and showed us her campaign materials, spoke to us very um, openly about her opinions about various aspects of Afghani law and what she wanted for the Bamiyan province. She wanted to see, you know, rights for women. She was very much an activist. She was 30 years old um, and had children and lived in very modest surroundings and we really appreciated the fact that she opened up her home and gave us hospitality and she did this actually on a Friday which um, would be equivalent to I guess like a Sunday here. It's a, a Sabbath for them. So it was very nice of her and this was the day immediately before the election. We were also able to meet with some local voters and spoke to them about what they hoped to see and they were all concerned about fraud. They were concerned about whether there would be enough polling places, whether there would be enough ballots available. They'd heard rumors that they would be shortchanged and I think um, that came into play when we got to election day. Uh, election day started at 7 o'clock a.m. so we got up around 5 and um, wait, made our way out to a girls school which was going to be the polling place that we witnessed for election morning. We got out there to watch them set up the ballot boxes and to count the ballots and to do all the same preparations you might see in a small polling place in the United States. They um, went through the certifications of everyone who was there and we all had to show our ID to prove that we were authorized to be there and they diligently checked and wrote it down um, and I was actually quite impressed with how well they were following all the instructions that were given. Um, training election officials in Afghanistan is not the same as training election officials in the United States. You're not just calling people up on the phone or telling them to look online and download a training video, that's not going to happen, especially in a place with limited electricity at best. Um, so everything is kind of train, you train people at the federal level and then they come out to the district level and then they come down you know, to the local level and then they actually find the local workers and um, train them. So it's amazing that this kind of word of mouth training actually results in such good results when you get to the polling stations tested the ink um, to see that it was actually adhering to people's fingers and that you couldn't wipe it off directly. You had to shake it up really well um, because Afghanistan is one of those countries that inks a voter's finger to prove that they've not previously voted. There are very few political parties in Afghanistan. That whole concept is just starting to come about. So um, there were four political parties who had names on the ballots, but not really people representing them. So each of the candidates themselves could have an observer in the room. The province in which we were located, Bamiyan, 
had 43 candidates on the ballot. So literally each of these rooms could have had 43 or more observers in the room. And you would find that in these tiny little classrooms, often with floors made of dirt, um, there would just be 25, 30, 40 observers crammed into a corner behind a striped line. And then the four election workers, you know, carefully doing their job on the other side of the line and letting the voters through. Females and males vote in separate facilities in Afghanistan. It may be separate rooms in the same building. It may be separate buildings altogether. Um, and then where we were, it was actually separate buildings in most of the locations. So we were at a female polling station in the morning and spent the afternoon at a male polling station. I think voters are a little bit off put um, because they've, this is their fourth election in six years, I guess, and they're not necessarily sure that this is working out the way they want it to. But I found that the youngest voters were very excited, um, kind of like you'll see in the United States, and the oldest voters were very excited. It was kind of the people, the middle-aged voters, that had a little bit more apathy, and I don't know that that doesn't necessarily play out everywhere. That was one thing I tried to bring to the table was when they saw a problem at the polls, I would be like, is that a problem that you're seeing because it's Afghanistan, or is that a problem everywhere? One of the things that happened was there were candidates who were driving voters to the polls. It happens all the time in the United States, and they were like, but you're not allowed to campaign, you know, right outside the polls. And these cars are coming up and they have campaign signs on the side of them or they have pictures of the candidate. And, you know, can, how can this be? And I'm like, well, if you figure that out, you know, let us know because it's still happening in the United States. So it's, it's a problem, but it's a problem faced by all election officials. And I think they were actually kind of relieved to know that some of the issues that they had on Election Day, the same elections that I would see here, you know, in, in the United States. It's not that very different. People oftentimes, I think, have very high expectations of what indeed is a fledgling democracy. We can't expect a country that's had four democratic elections in six years to have anywhere near the type of accuracy or integrity or anything that you would expect out of the United States, or we've obviously been trying this experiment for a long, long time. We still have issues. We're still working out issues like residency requirements and what to do about, you know, uh, populations that are on the move. You know, we're facing these questions day to day in this office. So we can't expect them to have figured it out in just these first few years. So for the basics, they're getting the basics down and it's going to take a few more elections. They only have, you know, they have five year terms that they're serving. So elections aren't happening every year. They're not having the opportunity really to hone these skills. Um, so it's going to be a slow process. And I think everyone has to be respectful of that very slow process. I'm sure the first few years of our democracy, it was a slow building process as well. So those are the primarily the, the two things I take back from Afghanistan is that there's still a lot of hope alive there. Um, I think that the United States can have some hope. Um, it's obviously struggling, but I think there are a lot of people inside that country that want to make it work. And if they have their way and if they have the resources available to them, I think eventually um, they can make it work and I wish them all the best.